something that was not yeah. going to get back. Right. 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 That's stopping perhaps some of those. The bus is out there, I think, until seven. Is that right? Your flash lights on. Until six. Okay. So if you want to, if you want to go run with some bubbles, we understand. Uh, I'll go ahead and call the um, meeting to order. This is the um, March, March meeting of the Alexander Transit Company Board of Directors. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I guess we'll we'll go ahead and uh, I see public hearing is um, before number one, but we'll go ahead and call the roll and uh, ask the anybody to form first. Uh, Chair Kaplan. Here. Vice Chair Kleist. Here. Here. Arish Kajer. Matt Harris. Here. Praveen Kapital. Here. Jesse O'Connell. Here. Hillary Orr. Here. Kirsten Phelps. Here. Kendall Taylor. Here. Ajaysha Thomas. Present. Arthur Wicks. Here. Chair Kaplan, you have a quorum of those absent. Uh, let's see. Arish Kajer. Arish uh, has work travel, so he had let me know um, that he would have to miss the first meeting, but he'll be with us next month. Um, we will go ahead and um, jump into the agenda. So we have a public hearing uh, first. Um, staff, do you have a presentation on the strategic plan or are we just going to take testimony? We talked about that. It is up to you. Martin can jump in and give a quick presentation, but we hadn't planned that as a part of the document because we've got a full agenda tonight. So it's up to you. I see we have some members of the public um, here. Were you, were you here because you wanted to testify uh, for the hearing? Or you there was trans dev. Oh, you were trans dev. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Were you here because to testify? I, I thought about it. Uh, I just heard about the changes to Dash Bus. So I was like, okay, I got to okay. I gotta hear what we're doing. Okay. So would it benefit you to hear the synopsis of the service changes then? Do you want to hear about that? You want to, we were going to take testimony, but we can do a brief overview of the service changes because that would be helpful uh, for you. So why don't we at least cover that aspect of it, of it, Martin, before we take testimony? Well, this slide. Good evening. Uh, so while Josh is pulling the slide, just a quick background. Um, what we're presenting tonight is the Alexander Transit Strategic Plan, ATSP. This is an annual plan that we prepare that uh, lays out a lot of the service changes that we're proposing for the next fiscal year, which will start in July. Uh, in this case, July 1st, it will be at FY25. So we are, are proposing a few changes, uh, potentially some changes that could be put into place. Um, we are looking for public feedback on the changes. Um, the routes are affected are potentially the 104, the 31, the 32, and the 34. Um, I guess uh, the board uh, is responsible for any, any changes to service in Alexandria. However, city council controls our subsidy of how much money we get each year. So if we're trying to increase uh, how much service we want and if we need additional funding, that's up to city council. Likewise, if we have service reductions that are being under consideration, uh, city council has to, has to weigh in on those. How did you bring it up? Very important. Okay. Great. We'll let you testify in a few minutes. We'll let Mark I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick here. You can, uh, you can review the full plan at dashbus.com slash strategic plan from our website. Next slide, Josh. So we do have one potential service reduction uh, proposed this year. This is uh, line 104. This was in the city manager's proposed budget. Um, it would reduce line, line 104 from every 30 minutes, every 60 minutes. Line 104 serves uh, for, it runs for Braddock Road, Pentagon via Rosemont, Northridge, Park, Fairfax. Runs during weekday peaks, currently every 30 minutes. Um, this change would save uh, about $180,000 a year, which is necessary due to other budget uh, constraints. Um, and final determination on whether or not this would be included will be made by city council during their budget approval process over the next couple of weeks here. Um, next slide. So uh, we do have a series of unfunded uh, improvements that we're hoping to implement. Um, top priority this year is line 32, which runs along the Eisenhower corridor. We are looking to improve midday, evening, and weekend uh, headways from every 60 minutes to every 30 minutes. It's the only core route that we have that only runs once per hour uh, during the week. Uh, so we're trying to increase that to 30 minutes, which we think would be much more useful. Um, you can see the map there. Uh, line 34, which you mentioned, operates in Old Town between Lee Center and Potomac Yard Metro. Uh, currently, it runs on Sundays every 60 minutes. We are trying to improve that from every 60 minutes to every 30 minutes, make it much more useful on Sundays. An important connection from Old Town to the Metro and a lot of other places along. The and then the last priority we have listed here again, these all, all these improvements are unfunded. Uh, this is line 31, which would be a, an off peak improvement where uh, all trips would be extended from King Street into Braddock Road. Currently, only every other trip goes to Braddock Road. So you have 30 minute service in Old Town during off peak periods. It would be increased every 15 minutes. 
uh, in Old Town that helps people in Old Town with the Old Town Circulator, but also folks out at NBCC, Bradley Shopping Center, ACHS, as they try to get into Old Town. A lot of those folks have to transfer to King Street Metro. They would not have to do that anymore. And I have the stats here on these improvements and potential reductions. All guys for the size. This is this table is available in the ATSB document as well, but it outlines some of the equity impacts, the ridership impacts, uh, and efficiency measures that we use. Um, that might be the last slide related to changes. In terms of the timeline, uh, we pretty, uh, uh, presented the drafts from ATSB to the board in February. We've got a public hearing this month, and then in April or May, the board would consider adoption. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of outreach going on right now. We've already had one community meeting. We've got two more coming up. Uh, we're going to pop up events this week at 40th. We're also handing out information about the changes for folks that are interested, um, and we're doing other other outreach as well. Uh, but but yes, that's that's the schedule right now. Um, and and like it says, board to consider adoption either April or May. It looks like a question. Uh, yeah, Martin. When when you look at the tweaking and the changing. Uh, in the, the bus ridership improvement, is there any calculation or plan to extend service into Arlandria and north into, uh, you know, down Mount Vernon? Because right now, a lot of the folks there, you know, lower income, of course, take metro buses at whatever the fare is versus our free fare, which, um, you know, I, I think would be a boost to ridership. Is there any way we could consider doing that? I know Council Member Geary and Jasha and I have all been sort of pushing for that. Yeah, so that's that's uh, feedback that I think we received last year as well, but we can include it in this year uh, <laughs> as, as a feedback we received this year as well. Um, I think there's some challenges with, with routing the buses up that that segment because once you go past Reed, you really have to go across the bridge into Arlington. There's not a way to really turn the buses around. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could, you know, you could, there's Executive you, Avenue or yeah, something there. Yeah, yeah. Um, that it could be done. So, so that is that, that is possible in some way. I mean, at what, at what extent, like, with the additional ridership, make it actually a benefit for us? Yeah, I mean, when we developed the ATV, um, I think we were assuming that that quarter would be covered by the frequent all day ten and ten B, um, and and we weren't fair free then either. So that's that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that just if you don't mind considering that. Yeah, I think we're still exploring, especially okay. in light of uh, Councilman McGeary's comments. So that's that's certainly something we can do. Too. Okay. And, and Martin, if I could add also, I think thinking about this now, as we anticipate that those two very large new um, housing projects are going to come online at that corner, right? So we know that, you know, three years from now, there's going to be even more potential ridership, you know, sort of at that intersection. So I think like looking at it now, even if we know that we might not be able to get to it, could sort of get us ahead of the game instead of playing catch up once that project comes online. Right. Yeah. Well, why don't we move into our public testimony? We have further questions. Uh, we're not adopting the um, Transit strategic plan tonight, so we'll we'll have more opportunity to talk with the staff. Um, I'm going to ask first, uh, just before I kind of go over the ground rules, we'll do we have anybody who pre-registered either in the room or on Zoom? Uh, um, on Zoom, uh, Arbor Doci, D O C I. Okay. Let me just go over the ground rules of the hearing then before we uh, we take our first speaker. We normally have a public comment period that starts every board meeting. We don't do that separately when we have a public hearing, but the policy for public comment would apply to hearings as well. So um, the ground rules, which I'll just read the statement that we have, we're about to convene into a public hearing. All dashboard meetings include a public comment period or a public hearing at the beginning of the meeting, as we believe it's crucial to hear from our riders and community members. The board is here to listen. However, please keep in mind that public comment period is not designed to be a discussion. Accordingly, please do not expect the board to respond to your concerns or questions tonight. We take any concerns and questions seriously and need sufficient time to process and research any issues. And since this is a public hearing, that would become part of the hearing docket for our consideration when we have final approval of the transit plan. Um, so we will respond through um, considering that when we take this up for final adoption, either April or May. Uh, personnel matters are not part of public comment period. However, we take any personnel questions seriously. You're asked to contact Dash administration with any such concerns. We ask that speakers and members of the audience maintain civility and respect for any divergent views that others possess. Further, we ask that speakers please address their comments to the board directly rather than the audience. So we're going to take pre-registered speakers first, as I understand we have one on Zoom, and then we'll invite anyone else um, first in the room and then on Zoom who wishes to speak who is not pre-registered. For future meetings, you may pre-register on the website dashbus.com on the board of directors page for public comment. Each speaker is allotted three minutes for comments. And if you are speaking on behalf of a neighborhood civic association or unit owners association, please identify yourself accordingly. And you may ask to be recognized for up to five minutes. So 
So we can go ahead and unmute our first speaker. And do you have anything you want to share about translation before we start? No. Okay. Um, the individual that Beth mentioned, I didn't see as a attendee in here. So uh, what's the other? Uh, the other uh, person is Dan Green. Okay. And mm -hmm. so we've got him uh, unmuted now. So Mr. Green, we're going to start your talk. Good evening. I think he still needs to unmute himself. It appears he's uh, joined us from two devices, so I'm uh, having to unmute both of them. I'm not sure which one he's able to speak to us on. There. Let's see if the other one's still muted. There you go. It does not appear that Hello. we can hear you. Hello. Oh, right. there there you go. Go. Now, now we can hear you. There <laughs> we go. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good evening, Stream. Your floor is yours. So I was a little Zoom challenged here tonight. Here it was. Uh, it, 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 things weren't running correctly, so hopefully there's no echo in this. But good evening, I'm Dan Green. I'm in the Northridge community. I've been riding dash buses and metro buses for 40 years, either in Arlington or Alexandria. I've been very dependent on that as a commuter to Washington, D.C. and into the district and so forth. I've Really, I was appalled when I heard about two weeks ago about the dash's plan to kill the rush hour bus for the Dash 104. As you recall, the Dash 104 was previously the Dash 4 bus. It had a 20 minute rush hour schedule. Uh, it was also part of the 3-4 line. During COVID, of course, many federal government workers and commuters into Washington, DC and the area, and the area there um, uh, stayed home. And so that has changed. I don't know if you've received, but I sent uh, all of the uh, city council uh, members a picture of our Dash 104 bus last Tuesday. It was not untypical of a rush hour bus between probably 7.30 and 8.30, uh, probably 7 o'clock and 8.30, actually. I was on the Dash bus last night at 7 o'clock, actually, and there were six passengers on the bus. But last Tuesday... There was 25 people on the bus. There was no empty seats. Actually, there was one empty seat. I asked everybody if I could take their picture and everybody agreed because I told everybody on the bus what was going on with the dash that you were going to change the rush hour bus from a 30 minute schedule, which is not very convenient for rush hour actually because dash provides 20 minute and even 10 minute services to the city. But to the North Ridge and the Park Fairfax community, it's a 30 minute bus. And I think we've kind of grown used to that to a degree. But an idea of changing the Dash 104 to a 60-minute bus is probably, for most of us commuters, if you're getting on, on a yellow line or something, or yellow or blue line and getting off of the Pentagon and you miss, as we historically do, miss the bus by five minutes, you're talking about a 55-minute wait to, to go three miles. You can walk three miles in 55 minutes. How does that turn into a commuter bus? How does that stop us from looking 30 for a seconds choice? remaining. How is the city servicing the North Ridge and Park Fairfax community? We are a part of Alexandria. Slowly but surely, Dash has been cutting our service. We killed the 3-4 line. We've cut back from our rush hour service, cut off on the front end of the rush hour, cut off your on the back end of the rush Please hour. Your time is up. Please finish your turned comments. It into a 30 minute. Anyway, the dash has turned into a choice of last resort. A one hour wait at the Pentagon to get on a dash is really unthinkable for all of us. There has been no community input. There's been no discussion from dash or from the city looking to Park Fairfax for our comments. This happened two weeks ago, out of the blue. Green, last okay. sentence, you're run over time. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, sir. 
I, I do want to let you know we will be having a discussion regarding the budget and we plan I plan to ask the rest of the board to authorize public testimony in opposition to the line 104 reduction. It is not a reduction that we wanted to do. We have to get the appropriate subsidy from city council in order to do so. And you're going to see us um, fighting very vigorously to get that restored and appreciate your comments and appreciate that you've been advocating with city council as well. Um, I do know that some council members have reached out um, and been discussing with staff kind of to work through understanding the implications of this cut, and what it would take to restore it. So I, I appreciate your continued advocacy and raising awareness among your fellow writers as well. Um, so we'll be discussing that shortly. Um, I will now ask um, if there are any speakers in the room who'd like to be heard. And if you want to make your cut, you can just say your name and the sentence you said so we have it in the record. Um, so, uh, I'm Alex Gray, uh, a disability commissioner. And uh, I, uh, my most frequently written uh, dash bus, I would have to say, is uh, 34, uh, especially since moving to the seven years. Uh, and especially considering that uh, I sometimes have to take it from here to there. Uh, when I go to my monthly commission meetings, I have to rely on sometimes a one hour wait for the, just for one bus that can haul me back to where it needs to be. So I, I definitely love the idea of reducing it down to 30 minutes because uh, it's like sometimes I can walk to the place before the bus starts. And the uh, rest of what I have to say, I, I guess I got to echo what Dan said. I, I think we should be reducing anything especially if there's disabled folks living in that community. And, and then there's, and then we just recently got a, what I call surprise attack in my neighborhood with an arena plan. So if that plan is finalized, which I personally hope it isn't, uh, but uh, we would need people to get to and from there as well. So that's all. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll now ask if anyone on Zoom who did not pre-register wishes to participate in the public hearing, you may indicate your interest by raising your hand, and we'll pause briefly to allow staff to monitor to see if there are any hands raised. No hand. Um, so with that, I will ask for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Matt, is there a second? Second. Second. <laughs> all, all in favor? Matt Aye. 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 All right. Public hearing is closed. Thank you so much uh, for our speakers for participating um, tonight. And so in terms of, um, are we going to have any further, uh, if there are further questions from um, board members regarding the strategic plan, would now be the appropriate time to ask it. I don't see it coming up again in the agenda. Would you like that now or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We can certainly cover that now. Uh, or Martin will rejoin us uh, the latter part of the meeting to talk about onboard survey outcomes. So it's okay. whatever works for you. I had just one, and if anyone else wants to jump in, that, that's that's fine too. Um, so following up, um, many of you were at the stockholders meeting or listening remotely to, uh, and we did hear from Councilman Gary specific request as Matt raised about the Alandria service. And I, I responded to him indicating I knew that we had studied it in the past and had given a pretty extensive response and wanting to kind of better understand what the bus would do there. But in terms of being able to be responsive to that in the strategic plan, it, can we put in some sort of study of looking at the transit specifically there, especially as um, it seems that there may be a metro bus change related to the 10A if that moves over to metroway service, which would change the kind of regional connectivity of that route. But looking at that neighborhood, is there special characteristics or anything that we've missed and that way we can at least uh, commit to doing that in-house just to kind of look at what opportunities are so that way we get the question again which i anticipate we we will we have some we, we can basically say here are the possibilities here's what that would cost here's what we would need in terms of fleet because i i would suggest maybe we actually amend the plan to include that as part of like our work plan for the year um just get your reaction to that I think that's a great idea. Yeah, for so FY25 would include in addition to these types of service changes, we would also be looking at this as a potential. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, it remains to be seen if it would be a cost neutral improvement or if it would be. So it may, may require that we would have to have it in next, if we decide to make a change, we have to be in next year's ATS. Oh, yeah. No, I understand. But yeah. No, it would just be at it, basically you know, the study of it so we can say we've actually more formally sure. looked at that and even kind of engaged with the community to find out is the transit serving them well, because some of I also wonder if that's just now that there's a fare on one system that <laughs> primarily serve their neighborhood versus one that's free, that we may not, you know, because we looked at kind of where the transit needs to go, we were agnostic about 
fair, but is there something we're missing there? And I think that would respond to his, from what I heard from him last night, I think we would appreciate that. So um, we can, I, if we need to propose that formally as an amendment to the plan, or if that can just be taken into account, um, what do you? I think we bring we bring the plan back to you next month. We can just make sure that that's included. okay. And hopefully not the yeah yes that's great. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions on the okay. yeah just on that Martin? Can you remind us when the better bus network redesign would be finalized and if that Lamada has given a date on when those changes one would be they would know what they are exactly and two when they would try to implement them. So we have a. Our, our, Meeting with them is on Friday morning. We're going to get more information on Friday morning. But from what my latest understanding is, is that the year one network, kind of the, the jumping off point, would be at 126. So not this coming this year. I asked because I took the WMATA survey on the budget, which had a long list of bus reductions. But one of them specifically was about the 10A moving to the Metro way for next fiscal year, which I did put, because some of them were like the draconian bus changes, and then some of them were the modest bus changes. It seemed like that one, well, I guess it would then also have merged with the Metro way. So I wasn't sure from, because the survey didn't kind of differentiate. This is like, you know, if we if we get this amount of money versus we get this amount of money, we do. But I wasn't, I had asked that because I wasn't sure if that was something they really were serious about for, for next year. Because they put it out for, for feedback, but maybe you'll know on Friday if that's, uh, that might have been part of the more ambitious long-term network as opposed to the year term networks. Okay, uh, but we'll find out on Friday. Okay, because they did ask for feedback on that yeah, proposal. Exactly. I know they still have to go through an outreach process as well to refine them for So, okay. Uh, that's gonna happen. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks, Mark. We'll see, we'll see you later in the meeting. Um, we will now take up the um, Board of Directors minutes from the February 14th meeting, which were included in your packet. Are there any um, corrections to the minutes as they were submitted? Now, is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Move not. Is there a second? Aye. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No? Thank you. Uh, we'll move into board member announcements, reports, and business items. So starting with the um, chair's report. It's been a, I've been talking a lot about DAPS this week, but it was for all very good reasons. It was so nice to see so many of you at the uh, event on Saturday. Staff um, did yeah. just a phenomenal job putting it together. I just enjoy it. Everybody I spoke to was just having a great time and I think felt very appreciated and just felt it was a really appropriate party. So um, I know there's just a tremendous amount of behind the scenes stuff that goes into putting on an event like that, but it really, from what I saw, was just beautifully executed. Uh, the video was absolutely lovely. It was just, it was hard with the echo in the room. I went, is that going to be posted on YouTube or made available in other places? So actually, I would love to watch that yeah. again in a yeah. uh, form where I could kind of really quote without the, the sound, but it was really it was a little hard. The sound was a little was hard in that room for, and when the, with all the people and people talking, but yeah, it's worth a watch. It really tells you a lot of insight into people who aren't, aren't here anymore. Yeah. I mean, they're here, but they're not here in Alexandria or not a part of the system anymore. And it's had such an influential role in setting it up. So. We were really happy we were able to capture their comments, including uh, Dave Van Fossen, who's retired from the industry, but we were able to get an interview with him down in Texas is where he is. I think you guys know Dave Houston. Yeah. So um, so that was really, really nice. Will you post that on YouTube? The full yeah. video or, or will it yeah. go on your Facebook? Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll send out a uh, link to everybody here. So you I think a lot of our writers would enjoy that. Yeah. Um, what was your feedback from staff? Did they find it as... Um sort of celebratory as we felt it was? I think so, yeah. I mean, everybody seemed to have a really good good time. There was a lot of good feedback. Um, and we, I think the, the biggest thing that staff really appreciate is when folks turn out and you all turn, you know, showed up and turned up in some situations and had a good time. And, and that just means a lot, I think, to everybody at the organization and myself included. So thank you all for that. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. That. And then you guys, Monday morning, had a bus park in front of King Street Metro. I saw that on your Facebook page. So, uh, you know, handing out goodies to our riders. So I don't know if you all slept on Sunday, but uh, it was really, it's it's been a wonderful celebration. It's great to, to see the, the energy around it. One last question. Were the awardees, did they know, or that was when they found out? Because the genuine shock and excitement was. Okay, the, the awards, right. So the, the, so, the years of service awards are not new to me, but yes, the the awardees are all um, kept quiet, except except for Beth. She <laughs> she managed to find herself in a meeting where this this she's part of the senior leadership meeting where we were kind of talking about nominees, and 
She was one of them, but we were still delighted to be able to recognize you. And but then I dropped off, so I didn't hear what the end So uh, That's <laughs> right. We, we sent her out of here. <laughs> like, said, so we be can't, because all the submissions for that are all submitted by staff throughout the organization, and then they're reviewed, and the senior leadership team weighs in and helps to sort of make some final decisions. And so, yes, we, we did kick you out for that conversation. But, <laughs> but yes, other than that, it's a surprise. Yeah. Congratulations, Beth. Congratulations, Beth. Well, then we have the stockholders meeting on Tuesday, and congratulations, everybody around the table is reappointed. We're an 11-member board, the kind of largest size we can be, largest we've been in a while, and uh, we look forward to having uh, three brand new board members and the perspectives that they offer. Um, your onboarding orientation is going to be scheduled. I know staff is very excited about getting you out to the facility, and I think that will really help you kind of um, get a get a hang of the kind of the work and also the rhythm of kind of things that we do. But just for tonight, we'll go around and just ask um, you guys were introduced to council, and many of us heard and uh, reviewed your applications as well. But if you want to just tell us um, your name is just a brief little bio about yourself, neighborhood you live in. Um, you have a favorite bus route that you uh, that you ride, uh, or one that's most frequent in your neighborhood, and then we'll go around and introduce ourselves as well. And I'll ask the staff that are here to introduce themselves too. So, uh, Kristen or uh, sure. So, hi everyone. I'm Praveen, uh, and I've uh, lived in Delray for almost ten years. Um, I took the 34 bus twice yesterday down to the stockholders meeting in fact. <laughs> um, and I, but part of my motivation for being here is that Dash is going through this zero emission transformation over the coming decade or so. Um, and that's something that I'm uh, really passionate about. And uh, hope to provide some perspective on that. Hi, I'm Kirsten Phelps. Um, I lived uh, my entire time in Alexandria, um, coming up on 10 years. Um, it near in the neighborhood near Fox Chase, um, and I uh, am a I I was drawn to this. I had got involved in the a rider advisory committee first, and um, just love the bus. I'm a big proponent of um, public transit, um, both for climate reasons, but um, essentially for me because of equity and system. I have a background. Um, as a attorney working with non-citizen populations, I now do policy, but, um, and so I've just really seen and been in those situations where clients are three hours late because they can't get a ride or find a bus or figure out a way to get um, to, a, to court or to an appointment. Um, and so um, I've just always been drawn to the importance of quality transit and I have kids and they are huge fans of Dash too. Some of you have seen them. <laughs> So enthusiastically <laughs> supporting the bus. Is your favorite bus line number 30? Oh, or? favorite bus line, yeah, definitely 30. I ride really a lot. If we could just go around names and uh, if you're a city staffer, want to say what your position is in the, the city as well. And if you have a favorite bus line, you can add that in as well. Sure. I'm Kendall Taylor. Um, I'm wrapping up being an interim deputy city manager on Monday, and I return to director of finance. Well, Adresha, we've met. Um, I've lived in Alexandria since 2011. I think as of late, I like to get off at Potomac Yard and take the 36 home. So I like that route. I want to see everybody get on that Target and get off and on and on. It's really cool to see. Um, so yeah. Jesse O'Connell, Delray resident, guy that gets things off high shelves. Uh, 34, but then also I'm going to plug the King Street trolley because I still have small kids and they just think it's a hoot to get on that and run that King Street. I'm Hillary Wall. I'm the deputy director with transportation. So my team is transportation engineering, transportation planning, and um, mobility services. Josh Baker, the general manager, uh, now for seven years. And uh, I most frequently run 30, obviously related to work. Um, you're going to say you love all the routes. I do love all the routes. I really like the 35. Um, just the, the neighborhoods it traverses and and uh, the, just the, I get really excited with use. And so 35 is such a heavily used service. It's really exciting to see see how people use the system and, and uh, how it benefits them. So 
course, we got rapid virus ship everywhere. So. <laughs> well, I'm Beth Ravellis. I work as an executive assistant at DASH as well as secretary to the board. Um, I've been with DASH for about three and a half years now. And uh, I've got a condo at Potomac Crossing, so line 34 would be the one I use most. Uh, Arthur Wicks, I'm with the city's Office of Management and Budget. And uh, I'm going to steal Jesse's and say the trolley just because I like seeing people who are very clearly commuters on there and people who are very clearly not from the city. So <laughs> really fun mix to see together. In one place. Uh, Matt Harris, I've been on the board for six years now. I've been in the Human Rights Commission for 22. And uh, instead of telling you my favorite line, I'm going to tell you my least favorite line. That's the 34. Uh, <laughs> fighting words, yeah. <laughs> but actually, I like the the thirty. Uh, Our public comment guy left. So was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, I'm David Kaplan, the chair of the board. I've been in Alexandria twenty years. I've been on this board since 2011, and just having a really great time with it. I live here in Old Town, so Old Town Circulator and the King Street Trolley are my regular buses, but I do have to say, I really have appreciated 34 connection to Potomac Yard was just a, the line I, I never knew how much I needed because I was just so used to coming back with heavy bags from Target and just transferring King Street Metro Station. Now I'm like, oh, I can actually go home on a 1C ride. So it's just amazing that, how much that has been so I'm going to change my answer for you. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Don't, let's not forget Steve on the screen. Oh, Steve, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, our vice chair. <laughs> Thank you, uh, and welcome to our new board members. Uh, I've been riding the uh, 30, formerly the AT8, since 2008 when I first uh, relocated to the area. I've been with the board now, I think it's going on 11 years, if I remember correctly, uh, but it's been an outstanding experience. And uh, I just extend my welcome to you. And uh, I live in Cameron Station, so uh, I think we have uh, another person who's uh, joining the uh, West End crowd. So we appreciate uh, that uh, representation on the board. So again, welcome to you all. And I'm sure you're going to find this a rewarding experience. Steve, and then um, I see Edwards on the, the Zoom. We'll let the staff and the audience also introduce themselves. You'll also get to meet them and know more about their roles when you go through your orientation. So Edward, if you want to, you want to go next. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Edward Ryder. I'm the uh, director of finance here at Dash. I've uh, been with Dash since uh, 2021. Um, I guess my favorite line would be the 30. I take that to, to work most days. So. He's the Twitter guy. <laughs> All of his Twitter, not mine. I'm bored. He tweets a lot. <laughs> and Martin? Yeah, Martin Barnes, director of planning and scheduling. Uh, I like the 31. Okay, so uh, my name is Camilla Olivares. I'm the director of marketing and public relations, and this is my third week. Um, I would say my favorite line is the third. Hello, my name is Raven Willie. I'm the chief infrastructure and development officer at DASH. I also live in a neighborhood near Fox Chase, and of course, my favorite line is the third. My name is Joseph Monica. I'm the office manager at DASH. My favorite is uh, 30. And then our transit desk said, do you want to explain why you're here in your relationship with that? <laughs> sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm Nick Frontonis, and I serve as a business leader for our transit management services um, business. Uh, we've obviously, uh, in one iteration or another, have been here at management uh, firm for a very long time, going back to David M. Fawcett, as a matter of fact. But I think he's got pretty shallow there. Um, I work real closely with Dave, consider my friends, so it's nice to hear that. Um, it's purely coincidental that we're here tonight, um, that you issued your RFP this morning. I think I, we did not know that, honestly, we did not know that. So we uh, normally will come through and just pay a visit, make sure that all of our services are being met with satisfaction. And that's why I'm certainly here. And certainly Kristen can tell you more about why she's here. I'm Kristen Tolman. I'm the region vice president, so I directly oversee our contract here. Uh, I guess it's been a while since since I saw everyone. Uh, and I don't have a favorite line because I live in Maryland. But I guess I'll go for a consensus. There we go. It's the consensus. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. I know that King Kristen, they came over from First Transit. So for our new members, Transdev acquired the First Transit United States operations recently. And Nick and Kristen have remained as our 
uh, our, our folks. This is it. And when you both go to orientation, I want to think of what the management services contract is and the scope of the services they provide. We're actually now in the process of, as uh, Nick mentioned, RFP to basically look at, um, you know, changes to that and allow, you know, an open competitive process for, for bids uh, to, to continue to provide those, those services. So thank you all for, for participating in that. And then the other item that I had, um, we sent a letter to WMATA. We discussed in February weighing in on their budget. Um, we, um, Hillary had agreed to draft a letter, which was an excellent letter that um, expressed concerns and kind of balance in the, in the budget, but we, we didn't have a motion formally on that. So we did circulate the letter just to see if there were any concerns about it. We didn't get any objections to the letter. So we went ahead and sent it, but I'm gonna ask if we could now vote on the letter that has been sent. Um, to a model which was included in your board packet. So is there a motion to approve the letter? Chair Captain, I move that we approve the submission of the letter to the WMATA with budget uh, back. Moved by Jesse, is there a second? Second. Second. Yeah, um, any further discussion? I'll just say on the letter for next year, what I talked with our, our staff about, um, we're going to in February, uh, basically a, a line item for WMATA um, as our staff has kind of an agenda management system. And just this was a very fluid year, so we didn't really know kind of in February exactly what was going to happen with the legislature. So we couldn't we didn't really have a framework for a letter, but we're at least going to get a motion that we will send a letter. So that way we're not doing it after the fact, even if the skeleton of the letter is still being um, debated, we at least know the board was clear that they wanted to do this. So for next year, it'll, we, we won't be doing it retroactively. Um, uh, all in favor of the letter that was submitted, say aye. 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 Opposed, any abstentions? That passes unanimously. That's all I have for the chair's report. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Hillary for Great, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I have a, I don't know if you guys put, put in the bulletin. That's fine. Um, the, uh, I wanted to, uh, give you an update on the King Bradley project, which I've been bringing you along throughout this process. We've had a couple of community meetings. We had one last month, right after our board meeting. Um, and we did post some, um, graphics and concept plans for basically some proposal, proposed changes to the service road, um, in front of the Bradley shopping center, um, one of which has a dedicated bus lane in it. So um, I hope that you all can take some time and look at those and then provide feedback. Um, I believe the form is open. We extended it, so it's gonna go through March 30th. Um, we, we've we been getting a couple a day. I think we're up to, yesterday we were up to about 70 or so um, comments on, on that. Um, but there are definitely, you know, if you're looking at it from a transit perspective, there are some options that focus more on, on transit. Um, so I would encourage you all to take a look at those um, and please provide your input. Um, also bringing you along throughout the year on the WMATA budget. Um, I, you know, we just voted for this this letter that, um, that the board submitted to WMATA. Um, we, um, you know, I, th I think we're still waiting to hear or might have more information on this um, on the actual operating cost and what the implication is for the city pending um, the final state approved budget. Um, but we, you know, I, I think that, you know, there are some services like the BW, um that they looked at uh, cutting. And, and so I, I think, you know, our board letter um, covered most of our, our thoughts on that. Um, I hope you all saw our, our e-news that went out um, about the city. This was the first year since the city adopted a Vision Zero goal. Um, now our goal for Vision Zero is to, to eliminate all traffic severe and fatal crashes by the year 2028. This year we eliminated all fatal crashes for 2023. Um, we did still have some severe injuries. We certainly have a lot of work to do, but um, we are one of, one of, um, I don't remember the full list. Not a lot of cities are, are where we are with this. And so we've made progress. And when you look at the crash history over time, we are seeing a, a downward trend in our, our fatal and severe crashes. So um, the focus of the Vision Zero program next year is largely going to be on um, 
seven of our really higher higher crash intersections, we received a federal grant to do um, audits, work with the community, and come up with concept designs for some of those larger intersections that are going to be much bigger capital projects. That'll be something we'll be um, kicking off probably probably uh, doing more internal staff work this spring, but might be kicking off by the summer. We also, um, every two years, we do a survey called Alex Moves. And this is a, a survey that um, our research firm Polko sends out for us. Um, we've modified it a little bit over time, but we try and keep a lot of the same questions so we can start to see trends. And the, the focus of this uh, survey is um, mainly to understand all trips that people are taking. So we use the state of the commute survey that is it's a regional survey to really understand how people are moving around how they're um, the choices they're making about their commute. Um, and then this survey is more focused on everyday trips too. So how are people getting to the grocery store? How are they getting to the parks? How are they doing their errands? Just um, it gives us a better sense of how people are moving around in, in the city. And the one highlight that I wanted to um, call out for this board was that um, the residents did report that public transportation is less convenient than other forms. Um, and when we talk about public transportation, I think that also includes um, rail. In Lamada, we're not just talking about dash, but the participants did say that time and convenience were the biggest, um, the biggest issues for them when they were choosing to make choices about how they got around with public transportation. So um, we are going to be doing a briefing, I believe, to the Transportation Commission. We always put that online. We just got it. So we're still kind of diving into to what that report said. Um, so I, I can share that link with you all when we have it, when we have it up and when we have um, you know more information about, about that. But I wanted to give you a little sneak preview um, that that is coming. And we do have some initial findings from that, that uh, survey. Um, hopefully we'll be diving into the trends a little bit um, as we look at it closer. Um, we also received um, funding for uh, a federal earmark. Um, this was submitted, I believe, in 2023. This was, right, it was 2023. It's been waiting for a while. Yeah, we've been, the, the <laughs> federal government kept kicking that can on the approving the budget. Um, but the city uh, is going to receive a million dollars in funds for mm. on route charging for electric buses in the city. So um, that's something that, you know, we don't know exactly when we will get that funding, but we are going to start working city staff and Dash will work together to formalize the location of, of where we could install this infrastructure. And then I have a question about that. Yep. Um, in the CIP, there's like 8.8 .8 million over 10 years for on route charging. Is the idea that the million from that grant would apply toward that amount or be in addition to it? That's a separate project. So that's a the project you're referring to is actually uh, public charging stations for private vehicles. Um, they it's about eight million dollars over ten years. That's, um, that's separate from the investments we're making in Dash Electrical. So is it outside of anything that's in the CIP? It, this was in the CIP, but I believe we put it in in FY26 because we didn't have the money secured yet for this one. Um, I believe I, I would need to look up exact, yeah. um, exactly where we if put we it. We it out completely or not, but we'll, we're going to recognize it as part of the budget right. once um, once we have guidance from DOT on when it's going to happen, right? Yes, I think we were um, debating whether we were going to have an on-route charging separate CIP category or whether it was going to fall within our overall dash uh, electrification. So we will figure that out. But either way, we will, when we get the money, we will figure out how to spend it. Does it have to be on-route? It can't be at uh, dash headquarters? It's it's for on-route charging. So like one location, two, or is that something, because I, I don't know where we do it now. Probably only more like one, just the way prices are. But would I it be in the West there, End, or where, I mean, how would you do it? Just keep the bus there overnight, or and then deadhead. No. In? So the this is a this is a catenary charging system that the buses are pre equipped for, where they're on in service, and the driver simply needs to add a little bit of juice, so gotcha. to say. So they're going to pull over to theoretically a station or stop that's convenient for whatever the service is wherever it's located and 
spend a predetermined amount of time there to add power back to the bus um, so that the bus doesn't have to return to the dash facility right now where it has to return to and be plugged in. There's so, a list of potential sites in the CIP. Yeah. So it's it's it differs from the charging that happens back at, at the shop. Um, not so much in the sense that the shop, the plan for the where we're parking the buses is not also to have the Cantonary style where we don't have to plug them in, but that's this earmark is very specifically the on route in out in the community for the buses so that the bus will stop there while it's in operation and and at, and there's been examples of it elsewhere in the country where those are positioned in a place where while the bus is laying over loading and unloading passengers the device connects to the bus and adds charge at that point in time and and just out of curiosity more than anything else um the schools got a few electric buses too. Are those all charged at a single location and is it interchangeable with our systems? I don't believe the schools have the overhead charge rails okay. infrastructure it's all... that's necessary for this. This is very specific to mass transit buses, heavy duty mass transit buses. The schools is also a very different application of electrification because if you think about how much a school bus sits yeah. compared yeah. to being on the road and so, the on-route charging, in our view, has very much been the key to a full fleet transition because you just can't expect a transit bus to be going back to the office every five hours or so and then sitting on a charger for another four hours. So the, the hope is that when we understand the technology and how it works and we test it and we, I mean, that it's an earmark, right? So it's going to be an opportunity for us to see how it works. The, the hope would be that we would get to a point where the, the system can be built in a way that the bus ends up there at a very specific time on a regular basis. And in theory, in that situation, no different than if you plug your phone in every for five minutes every hour, the bus would just be able to keep going. That's, that's, that's the concept. It, hopefully that's helpful. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very different. And no, no, the no. charging structure at the office is really being handled on a low note yeah. and, and the other building projects. And um, you're correct, there there is a 8.8 .8 million in the budget. There is an electric bus on route car charging CIP. Um, this particular funding we had pushed, we had put it in the FY26 year because we didn't know when we were gonna get it at the time of the budget. We didn't know we were getting this earmark. Um, the only secured funding that we show in here is in FY30 we had put in our CMAC RSTP, congestion mitigation air quality improvement. Um, we had put in a million dollars that we we will get this year for we will it'll be approved this year for FY30, and the rest of the funding is unsecured, so it's grant. So we would have to go after. So that was got where so this, this is was part of that seven point eight yes. that we have now yes. secured. Okay. Yes, yeah, so now we have six point eight to secure. <laughs> <laughs> Two and, million secure. And and would this go in for FY25 or we don't know yet? Uh, I don't know if it would be a technical adjustment. We we might have to do a supplemental. It's probably going to be a supplemental once we get more. And I apologize. There are literally two projects in the CIP, both around eight and a half million dollars that deal with charging vehicles. So I got them confused. I forgot there's a separate one in the transportation section. So apologies on that. So um, the last uh, note that I put in here, I got, I don't know if you guys get it emails from WMATA, but I thought this was kind of cool. They, they are doing um, a Metro Expo for their new trains and buses, and they're kind of giving the public a sneak peek at all the um, the new rail cars and zero emission buses, and this is March 20th through April 3rd, and it's daily from 9 to 5 um, on the, the National Mall, so that was kind of cool, so I wanted to share that information with you all as well. And that is it. I'm happy to answer any questions. You're going to be displaying an electric articulated bus, something that's been running in Alexandria for <laughs> several years. I will run it well. So that, there you go. <laughs> so they're really excited to demonstrate the new technology, but we did it first. <laughs> Just a sign of the <laughs> question about the survey. Um, so this is like the fourth time the city has done it. Do you ask a question as to like if people have filled out the survey before the different people each time like how are people you get asked? I've gotten it once um it's oh. it's a random sampling um, okay so they send it out by mail I think we've had um 
we've had years where we didn't get a lot of responses. And so then they do follow up calls cool. randomly. So it's a completely random sample of Alexandrians. Okay. So, yeah. uh, yes, but I've only gotten it once out of the four years. So if anybody else has received it. I just had a follow-up question too on, on the survey. I what because I don't think I've ever gotten it. Um I would assume it's it's asking demographic questions. Yeah. And with those track to the demographic questions that the dash onboard survey. I don't know if we line them up. We try and usually be pretty consistent in the city. Um, but I, I don't think that I would have to go back and look at exactly what they are. They might try and line them up with census questions. Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure, but you know, I, I'm remembering that this time, I don't know if we did this also last time. After we did the um the random sampling, we also did a, a sampling where people could choose to participate in the survey and provide feedback. Um, and then they, you know, I don't know, I don't know how they if that's just information for us. I haven't looked at this yet. Um, or if they figure out a way to make that also significant, but do we get no responses this time? Because last time was like during COVID, right? Yeah, yeah last time wasn't great, and they had to do a bunch of of cold calls to <laughs> to get up to the point where it was statistically significant. But I, mm -hmm. I I didn't hear that we had to do that this time, so maybe more people filled it out. Yes. Um, sorry, a question that wasn't specifically in your report, but at the stock, I knew you were in the room at Stockholm's meeting last night. So, Councilman Chapman, um, you know, noting uh, we talked about bus stop accessibility, asking that we kind of come back with potentially a plan on dealing with some of the, the parking issues. Um, we certainly, you know, want to coordinate and support. And I've heard in the past that a lot of that also was that, you know, staff doesn't want to be the only ones out there saying, hey, we're going to take parking away. We need, we, <laughs> excuse me, we need backup and our board can. <laughs> give some some cover or some other place to maybe channel anger uh, or concern about that. Um, can we, um, you know, kind of talk about how we might start to tackle? Maybe there are. I know I know we have the King Street study that's that's ongoing, looking at then those. That certainly would be a huge help. But if there, so we can kind of maybe tackle quarters or priority bus stops. So you're doing the index that we can help um, with that. So we have you know additional good news we can report next year. Yes. So we, um, as you might know, we lost our transit program manager and we have a new person starting in April. So um, uh, Silas Sullivan, who is uh, also on the transit team, has been kind of covering two roles. And so he is going to be, um, once he gets a little more free time, once we can get our other person in, he is going to be really focusing on um, and working with the DASH team too on our inventory and working on the prioritization of that. And, and the um, whether parking was one of the reasons was part of that. Um, you know, if parking alone was the reason it was inaccessible was part of that. So we're going to be looking at that, prioritizing, and then kind of coming up with a, a path forward of, of how we might um, start to tackle some of those areas. So we'll, we'll certainly share that with you. We just need to get our, our new person on board so we open up a little capacity. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I did say, you know, I was given talking points related to bus stop accessibility, and you guys did a lot last year, and I hope, you know, that came through in the presentation because you all are making good progress and whittling down this list and um, being creative in, in the funding that we're using. To, yeah, well. and, and we just talked recently, too, um, about making sure that the DASH team is getting our three-year paving list in advance. I know our team goes through and we look at the where we're paving because when we pave, we go out and we upgrade curb ramps and things like that. So we have concrete folks out there. We try and catch the bus stops that are missing a pad. Um, but now also having this, the all the inventory and GIS, we can overlay it with the paving routes and make sure that if there's locations where we, all we have to do is build out that concrete pad to make it accessible, that we're getting that done with um, resurfacing and having another set of eyes on it from the DASH team will be helpful to make sure that we, we catch all those. Great. Thank you. Um, we always include time in our agenda for other um, board members. Many of you serve on boards, commissions, and, and groups. And if there's anything that would be beneficial to bring to the attention of the group, now is the time to do that. If not, then we'll move on to the general manager's report. Hey, uh, I think Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, good evening. I my introductions were taken away from me, but that's okay. We've gotten through them. But again, uh, welcome to Camilla. We're very happy to have her with us. Um, she jumped right in and um, probably is wondering what, what she did when she had to jump in and help with the 40th event and the <laughs> outreach for the ATSB and the pop-up events and everything else. So, uh, But as a reminder, Camilla will also 
um, be overseeing all of our marketing functions, our communications functions, things like websites, outreach, uh, community outreach events, uh, public engagement, those kinds of things, as well as she'll also have responsibility over our customer service functions. Um, and the intent there is to help her gain a better uh, connection with exactly what's going on with our ridership and what we're hearing and who we're connecting with and uh, where we need to be attentive to. So we're excited uh, to have her with us and um, what she's going to bring to that. Um, so I also want to welcome another family member, a DAC family member, um, pleased to announce that Stephanie, our Chief Operating Officer, gave birth to baby Sienna um, on March 4th at 3.59 a.m. Uh, Mom and baby are doing quite well, and um, she has actually been texting me periodically, so she must not be too exhausted. Um, but otherwise, we're happy for her and our new board members. She'll get to meet Stephanie when she comes back in June. Um, but uh, she told me that the due date was like March 4th or 5th, right, Ray? And, and then there was this whole panic thinking the baby was going to be early. And sure enough, the baby came on time. So I said, that's a transit baby because transit comes <laughs> on time. <laughs> um, continuing the great news, our ridership continues to uh, excel. As many of you heard when I made my remarks at the, uh, the 40th anniversary event, we are still trending above. Uh, any historical ridership in the history of the system. And um, you will know that there are seasonal dips, um, particularly in the cold winter months, as well as the middle of the summer that is normal. Part of that is also related to, part of that is related, related to vacation, people going out of town. It's also when schools are not in session for brief periods of time, along with holidays, when a bunch of holidays fall. Uh, one day of a holiday can have a pretty substantial impact on our ridership numbers. So uh, everything looks really good. And we're really hopeful that we'll be talking about 5 million rides at the end of the year. I know this is just showing through January and here we are in March. And I know that the last thing I saw in February was also well above. So um, always great news there. And I know Martin's going to talk a lot about the survey responses. And I think the survey is also telling a little bit of what are the top three things. There's one of the charts in here that we've given to you that's a turnout as well. That's sort of what's important for riders. Going back to ridership, how sure. are operators counting the numbers? Because when I got on the bus the other day, she was doing it like manually. Um, is, are the the machines that we put input are not working anymore, or like is it just a backup to verify? We're we're doing both still. We're still doing uh, basic production. So in uh, in uh, in completed the installation uh, of a retrofit of all hundred and one buses uh, with our APC all day passenger counter last year. Um, we are still fine tuning that. There were some hardware challenges. Okay. Uh, so we had to go through in uh, last month. We had a team that was going through every bus to, to add some brackets and do some things that were going to improve. So now we're, we're recalibrated. We've recalibrated that we're doing some more testing. The intent is that, fingers crossed, we'll be certified and can get rid of the fare boxes and switch to APCs by the start of that point. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I was just wondering why she was clicking yeah. when I got on the bus. Yeah, we and and that certification from the National Transit Database is pretty stringent as well, as far as margin of error and filling in data gaps and those kinds of things. We've got a wonderful system that gives Martin insight. So I think long term we'll really have some good perspectives, particularly on a rider uh, a stop level basis as well as time of day and those kinds of things is really really good information. So Thank we'll definitely you. be seeing more robust ridership reports in the future. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um. The next item here is, uh, as is as usual for this time of, of the year, we are following the city manager's proposed budget, which was presented um, in February. I want to just summarize some things about the city manager's proposed budget um, and uh, what we learned about it, that it is focused on addressing employee compensation and collective bargaining agreements, certainly a, a priority that sh is shared with DASH. Schools have been funded although I know there is some controversy there um, that um, is struggling with what the school board has put forward compared to what the manager has included. Um, there are some strategic investments, um, including affordable housing and economic development. It is a $911.3 million budget, um, but it maintains current tax rate and services. Um, employee benefits are adjusted, step increases along with 2% pay increases for eligible city staff. Um, a community focus investing in initiatives to strengthen connections and address disparities and key takeaways 
Uh, it really does prioritize employee school and key city initiatives without raising taxes. Uh, that's the broad overall city manager's budget. We were uh, delighted and thankful to the city for the efforts in putting in the current services funding for DASH, which is a um, $4.6 million increase uh, to the general fund amount that is contributed to DASH operations. Those are uh, almost entirely driven by the cost of our collective bargaining agreement, along with the now uh, next year will be total elimination of the TRIP grant. So we are currently in year three, next fiscal year will be year four. That is a conditional year that's required as a part of the grant and the recipient receiving the $7.1 million that we got over the past three years, we have to be fair free. Um, so a little nugget there as a board member in case you hear questions about going back to collecting fares, um, it's a pretty easy response there um, on the side of the grant. And I'll give you some other facts as it relates to fair collection uh, if you ever need it. There are reductions included uh, to the DASH budget that is the full reduction amount, which was approved by the board back in November. It includes uh, administrative reductions of 200,000 plus and uh, the reduction of line 104 from the 30 minute peak frequency to a 60 minute peak, peak frequency. Um, much of many of the details related to the line 104 reduction, we can certainly talk about, but that was something that was also discussed heavily in November. So. We understood uh, the, the reason for putting these forward. Um, the, uh, there is also one supplemental, there, the, none of the supplementals are funded, but there is one notable supplemental that um, is a little bit concerning that we don't have funded, which is the local grant match. Uh, this required for the state grants that DASH um, uh, resolved to apply for and city council also resolved to apply for. Um, I'll talk a little bit in detail on these things in a moment, but um, that's sort of the broad picture of the city manager's budget. I think at the end of the day, it is a solid budget and really something that uh, is incredible that the city has pulled together without a tax increase, frankly, um, considering the challenges that the city has faced with, with revenues starting to, um, I don't wanna say decline. They're, they're, they're leveling to a more normal level than they were um, as opposed to where we were just it was wild and crazy. Josh, can I add yeah, that last night sure. council set their the maximum that they're going to advertise and they did set that at four cents. The four cents, yeah. yeah. That doesn't mean it, it will go to four cents, but that gives them yeah. the ability to have a conversation about things that they might want to uh, change. So, in the manager's proposed budget. Right? So, and then they decide on that, I think, in so I the, the calendar. The introduction slide, but... of the tax rate was last night. The public hearing on the tax rate will be near the end of April, and then adoption is May 1st. Okay. Um, I just wanted to put a slide back up so that, of course, our new members, as well as those of you who may not remember what happened in November, because I had to go back and look myself. Uh, the supplementals that the board prioritized were, of course, number one, the local grant match. Grant, grant match. And speak tonight. Uh, line 32 service enhancement, line 34 service enhancement, and line 31 service enhancement in priority order. There was also a contractually required supplemental to be submitted, um, which was done in uh, recognition of a clause in the collective bargaining agreement that would um, add a 1.5 additional wage increase above the existing 4% wage increase, which is included in current services. So um, the the workforce is receiving a 4% increase and that is funded through that current services budget. Uh, in negotiations, there was uh, a agreement to add an optional, basically an optional 1.5%. So uh, that was submitted accordingly. Um, as far as actions moving forward, uh, the, the chair asked if uh, we prepare a set of talking points for you all to consider and discuss as a part of the conversation this evening and including in advance of any testimony that may occur or you may wish to provide uh, in addition to what the chair is going to provide on behalf of the board. So we have provided a printout of those talking points. I wanted to summarize uh, those to you and as the slide indicates here that I think the, the, the first and foremost important message that needs to be brought forth is how critical it is to fund the current services and do what we do today, tomorrow, and the fact that the city manager has prioritized doing that, uh, deserves recognition. Uh, secondly, that we have heard a lot about line 104 and the reduction. We anticipate continuing to hear more outreach 
from the community that is affected, but communities affected by that. Uh, the concern there is obviously that one hour service, one hour frequency is relatively unusable for, for commuters. Um, one thing that I would add is that the post pandemic commuting patterns are drastically different. And uh, one of the things we do know is that commuters are not going in as often, but if you think about when they do go in, those are more unique experiences with the bus and more opportunities for them to be dissuaded by a less frequent service, um, as opposed to if they were riding every day and built their schedule around that. So just a little additional talking point that's not really on here. Um, and then third here is to, to bring to light the concern about making sure that we uh, fund our, did that go away? Okay. I saw it go dark. Um, to failing to fund our local grant match puts us in uh, a little bit of a challenging situation with the state as we are anticipating uh, full funding of the grant applications as submitted and would require that additional 54,000. As a note, the 54,000 is not the total grant match amount. It is simply the amount that is in addition to the previous year's grant match amount, which is included in the DASH budget. Um, Finally, before we get into questions, I just wanted to highlight here a little bit for you. As Kendall noted, um, there are a number of things going on in the in the budget calendar, and I have circled here the next public outreach uh, that the, the council will be having is the public hearing on Saturday, March 16th. That's this coming Saturday. Uh, I believe our chair is intending to provide testimony at that. Uh, the other thing to note is that on Wednesday, April 3rd, we will sit down with council as a part of the work session to discuss the DASH budget, uh, provide answers to their questions and uh, support the city staff in helping to explain how the budget was developed and what are the things that have gone into that. Um, and then the rest of the process is posted there, but I think those were the two things that I wanted to make sure I highlighted. Certainly tonight, council is actually downstairs in about 20 minutes getting ready to start uh, a budget work session as well. So it's a busy season for them. Um, all this information is available at alexandriava.gov slash budget. Um, so those are my summary items of the uh, city manager's budget. I wanted to allow the time during my presentation, Mr. Chair, for you to interject any dialogue that you wanted to make sure you had with the members as far as making sure that not only are we um, helping to tell the same story, but also the staff can listen in and make sure we will make edits to anything that you all discuss here if you have concerns, if there's something that doesn't resonate well, it seems missing, we'll be taking note of that and then um, we'll draft the new set of the talking points for you all to be equipped with as you meet with any council members or constituents within the community who may be concerned, particularly about the 104. Uh, as we know, that's the thing that we've heard the most about at this point. So we can open for discussion. I, I have a question to, well, an observation and a question to start with. Um, I know that um, certainly the, the 104 cut is certainly resonating in the community. We got a question even at the stockholders meeting last night uh, from the vice mayor about that reduction and, and said we would address it further on, on Saturday. So I think they're they're hearing from that. The grant um, piece of it is the fifty uh, fifty-four thousand dollars. Um, the $54,000 is a supplemental. Yeah. Um, so that, that's that's not a reduction. That's simply a supplemental. Well, it could be a reduction if we don't receive the funding because we have to then come up with that. I, I guess I, I, I guess my question is, just, right. can we walk through that a little more? Because I'm just trying to understand, you and, you and I have had some conversation about uh, perhaps what past policy was when we submitted our budget and then how this became a supplemental, just in terms of how you kind of tell that story. Because I don't think that one's not on anybody's radar sure. screen yet. Um, well, I think quite simply, the the, uh, the approach here is that if, it, if there is a marked change, and this is applying to all parts of the city, all departments, uh, inclusive of that, to um, a line item, and I don't know exactly what the trigger is, and between Edward and Kendall and others who are more deep in this would probably be able to speak to it more eloquently than I can, but as I understand it is essentially that um, because it is an increase to the normal or the previous grant match amounts that we were already budgeted for, it is considered a supplemental. It is true that um, in past years, we were asked to submit the supplement, uh, su submit the grant match as a part of the current services budget. So it's a change in sort of process. Um, I'm not commenting whether that's good or bad, or it's just that's how that ended up becoming a quote supplemental as opposed to many members of the board probably never saw this. We never saw 
it wasn't ever a discussion item. It didn't come up before because it was a part of current services. So that's the difference. There is a current services amount. It is still the same as it was last year, and it is funded. It is that 54000 additional. And to your point, Mr. Chair, if that's not funded, we either have to back down on the, the grants um, because we don't have the matching funds, or we have to rebalance our budget by pulling that 54000 from somewhere else within current services. Remind me what yeah. this grant specifically funded that we, I know we applied for them in December, but can you, especially for um, this numbers. is, this is encompassing the passenger information displays that we're uh, piloting and were shown on one of the buses to you all. This is including the safety um, systems. It is called a through view system to uh, reduce the likelihood of pedestrian impacts and increase driver visibility. And thirdly, it is uh, the uh, continuation of the, um, uh, public transit intern grant that has been highly successful at DASH uh, for, for many, many years. Did I miss anything? Those are the those are the three components of that. Okay. Thank you. I, I just want, can you elaborate? So you had a grant funding before and you had a sufficient amount in your budget to match what you were getting before, or this is new grants you're going for and you need, you're trying to leverage dollars and we get that. That is, right. a, that is an important thing and you're right, it is a priority. But it's it's a supplemental if that's a new thing you're going after that needs new city money. Right. So it's right. it's I mean, it's a lot we can get for fifty four thousand, but it's still related to something above and beyond. It sounds like from what it's currently what you're doing. Now. That's correct. So the intern grant is a year over year thing that we do every year. One of these grants is called um, demonstration grant. So we have a limited number of grants that are available to us from the state. One of them is called a demonstration grant. And the, the intention of that grant is to um, bring new technology into a system that the system is otherwise already potentially considering or wants to prove its viability um, and ensure that it works for them or demonstrate it to the public as far as an investment in improving the public transit experience. Um, and the... Um, uh, the conditions of that grant are that it can't be the same project every year. So each year we're expected to identify things, right, that are new, that, that fit the mold of the expectations of that grant and submit them. What um, the reason that the, the amount varies has very much to do with what is the, what is the technology, for example, we're piloting. In the, in the last year, one of the things we received was the uh, automated wheelchair securement system that will be piloted on some buses that allows a wheelchair passenger to enter the bus, push a button and be secured automatically without the driver having to um, assist. Um, so those are just some examples, but you're exactly right. It, they are new things and it is different from what we had done previously. It is not a continuation of a particular service with the exception of the public transit intern. One last question. Yes. It, are, have you been awarded these grants yet or are they still under consideration? What's, what's the announcement? Is uh, typically sometime in yeah. April, May. They, they have not been. They have not been announced. They have, yeah. yeah, they've so not been announced. That's the other reason yeah. too, to not put money in a budget just in case. It, it's easier to find money if necessary versus here. If this happens, here's money, and so that's the the conversation can keep happening. But that's a that's an approach to budgeting that we we would not just allocate resources in case you need them. We allocate resources that we know we that aren't necessary. Sure. But if they were doing I and I guess what I understand is they they're doing the the delta between the grants from year to year in the current services budget, even if we hadn't been awarded them in the, the past. Is that what I'm understanding from the, the intern grant and Edward can chat grants like in tests and I wish we yeah if this is the grant and each year it costs a little more but we're getting that then than that, but if these are new things we're going for that have new matching need or new city support need, and we also don't have the grant yet, that that's where it's a, a different animal. These are, we haven't done these things before other than the intern. And are you funded right now to match what you need for the intern in your base budget? Yes, I, I believe so. Edward is still there. Um, is that accurate, Edward? So yes, that's yeah. mostly accurate. Um, it, it, what we have in current services will fund the intern. Um, it's a new intern grant though that we get awarded. Um, but prior to I think FY twenty four and then FY twenty five, we had kind of I guess 
our line items were not as uh, dissected on a city level, I, I would say. And so we would kind of figure out, okay, this is ballpark where, where we expect we'll need to go after. Um, and so we would put that into current services in the past. Um, this time around, essentially, we had awarded in current services last year a certain amount. And then going from this year, that's the amount that went into current services. And so the delta there wasn't something that we were able to add into current services without it having been a supplemental. So it's kind of a change in the process too. So it's a combination of, yes, these are new grants that we're going after, but also we would, prior to the last um, two budget cycles, we would kind of, we would find that in current services as we anticipated needing it. Question, how do we talk about this to council? Because I, I have three minutes and I also have to address the 104. How do we, because I mean, these are very important programs to us and, and in the talking points, even it indicates that we could have some challenges in, in our awarding of future grants. Uh, perhaps if then we rebalance to take something away from service, I suppose, to offer this. Well, it, I mean, it may be, maybe there's a approach on the city side that we just need to tuck under to, to what Kendall's getting at maybe and see where it comes out. I, I'm okay either way. If, if we get awarded the, the grants, what I'm concerned about is I don't want to say the state, we don't have the money to match it, right? So if if that's accomplished by the supplemental being refunded or, or funded, or it's accomplished simply by saying, when the grants come through, this is the amount of grant match that we need and simply having that conversation with the city to figure out like, how do we fund that or do it, or if it becomes a supplemental appropriation later, I, it, it doesn't matter to me how we get there. What kind of what Ed was speaking to was it was historically expected of us to make sure that we accounted for that in our budget. And so we did. And so now we are, we're accounting for that, but it's being seen as an addition. So it's being viewed as a supplemental which is fine. And I don't disagree with the statement that it is a supplemental because it is. Um, I just want to make sure that at the when those come through, because we also have a resolution from the city council and DASH that says we're going to apply for these and we have the money to fund them, um, that we don't end up in a situation where we say, well, actually, we don't have that money. That's and maybe that's not a council conversation. Maybe it doesn't need to be a part of these talking points, but it was for this board an understanding of one of the supplementals that our board prioritized as number one, right? That isn't that that isn't in there. And that's the only one that potentially has the implication where we run into a situation where we staff, and I don't think this board has the authority to commit additional funds to that absence of reshuffling the total amount of money that has been provided to us under current services. So Will hopefully that grant applications go to council. The rest of this city, if you're applying for a grant, it goes to council for approval to apply. And yep. at that point, there's the fiscal impact where we say, here's what's required and the grant match and how we're going to pay for that. So for the grants, when you applied, what did you say, What how the, the grant match was going to be covered? I don't know what the resolution read. Well, there's some, some resolution, right? So the resolution, resolution did include the amount that said, you know, up to X dollars of local match. Um, I don't recall what they would have said for where it was going from. I don't know if you ever include that. Because I think that funneled through tests, right? Either you would not be able to speak to that. We yeah. can look it up too yeah. and see, because that's part of why we do that. Okay, we're going to commit to this, and here's the requirement, and here's where the source is for that. So we have, so before council even commits to applying for something, they know what the city's responsibility and obligation is going to be. And we as a city know how we're going to pay for it. Yeah, I, I think that <laughs> the comment I would add is I, I don't, and I want to be careful about commenting much on your budget comments, but <laughs> I don't know that this needs to be included in it because there are a lot of avenues if we are awarded this grant for us to explore before we get to the Sorry, we couldn't come up with the money for this grant, you know, including looking at Dash's buses, including looking at we have transit funding sources in the city that we we prioritize for leveraging grants. 
and elsewhere, including MVTA 30% funds. Um, that seems like there are a lot of solves still on the table before we go right to the, we're gonna lap some grant money. Um, I do think there's probably, sounds like if this is, uh, you know, if we do get awarded and there clearly is a gap, there needs to be a staff to staff conversation about, yeah, I think there, the, the other and to all of this is, uh, Edward mentioned this changing about two years ago. Two years ago was when we got our new city, roughly when we got our new city manager. And one of his first things um, when we were going through a budget process with him was he was concerned and confused about the level of scrutiny that go to our partner agencies relative to city departments. So that's also the same time you saw some changes in process, including like how supplementals and current services are handled. Um, that's not to excuse what's happening. I think that's to say this is an odd sort of gap between that that practice that probably we could work out better. Um, but I just I to come back to the comments thing, I, I worry about making a lot of uh, comment on this because there's a lot of administrative solves to fifty four thousand dollars in a nine hundred and eleven million dollar budget plus a lot more for you all funds. But what's what's the amount of leverage like <laughs> Worst case, we didn't come up with this. How much grant funding are we giving up? Well, this is an 80 20 grant. Okay. So, it's the, about 200K. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's, um, I, I mean, it's my recommendation if it's worth bringing up in the budget discussion, it's just that Dash, if Dash is awarded these grants, we're going to have to come up with 54,000 or we're giving up 200,000 grant funding. But let's if it fits within your three months. Yeah, I mean, my main concern, I kind of you have to go sure, shortly. Um, um, is, is just like was Dash being treated differently from any? Was it just like this was a new process for us, and we weren't sure was were our grants being treated differently than others in the city, which I think would require then council attention to it. It sounds like that's not the case here, but there just there is a kind of a communication disconnect as you were getting to yeah. art that I think we need our staff needs to work out with the city on. Yeah, I, I, um, I certainly can only speak at depth to the capital side, but I, I can tell you that when Tess tries to put forward a year one request that we have pretty appropriated and the grants not awarded, we don't allow it. We, we have to push it back and there are a number of administrative avenues of which we could go to recognize the funding uh, and, and get a project moving along, but we don't we don't oh uh, we don't give budget authority or local match to something that's just a, re a request at that time on the capital side. So that it, it, from my perspective, it's a line of process. I'd have to talk to our operating analyst about how that works in the test operating side. But I want to look at the grant application too and just yeah. see what we said to council. Yep. Um, what was that? I I do have to go to Old Town Civic. I tried it. Um, but the I would not waste your three minutes on the fifty four thousand dollars. Yeah, that would be my advice. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, one other comment, what you could say though, if you wanted to, is something along the lines of, uh, we're working productively at the staff level to understand opportunities for leveraging these, these grant opportunities. So you know, one of the things I mentioned in the, in the talking points is the administrative reductions are straightforward and, and are fine. And so there's something that, Made sense. Um, so really, all that's left at that, that point is the the one four. Sure. Yeah. You don't well, have any action sure. items, Mr. Chair. Okay. So and, well, and I think we have to authorize testimony, but are we is six a quorum for eleven or? Sorry. Yeah. 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 It's so it's not too majority. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, I yeah. think they don't. Uh, Zoom doesn't count for the quorum. No, he does. He, oh, yeah. Well, he counts for voting. It's just the quorum has to be met. First. Quorum has to be met. Yeah. Okay. okay. And I think Praveen is joining rejoining too. So yeah, he is. Um, if you're still uh, soliciting um, talking Absolutely. points, yeah. So it's actually guidance to both of you. You offered sort of in your remarks that you're happy to provide more information on the kind of like what would it cost us to collect fares again. And I, I've seen that. I've, I've used it like three or four times this week. I think it'd be very useful to circulate that to the whole board. Okay. David, I would encourage you to put that in your testimony because I think it is something that is repeatedly, even in the last 10 days, cropped up as, oh, wouldn't this be a possible avenue? And I think having those numbers and facts out in black and white will take 15 seconds of your mm -hmm. testimony. I think it'd be really helpful. So you're saying what we would give up from the trip grant if we didn't meet the obligation? I, I think a lot of something they... like, uh, 
you know, the question has been raised, could we meet this budget deficit through returning Dash to a fair bearing service? And I will, I'm here today to say that that would cost us $14 million up front to yield $2 million of revenue three years from now or, or whatever the mm -hmm. specifics are, right? And, and and sort of just to make it very clear that like, it's not an option. It's not something that really anybody should be talking about as a, as a serious way forward. Sorry. Yeah, and it may be too um, premature to, to go into a comment this year, but I think laying the grammar, particularly for next year's budget, if we're here again, where, you know, there's not a grant clawback if, 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 if in the fiscal year 26, you know, we, we instituted fairs is, you know, I think that maybe just the question for investigation is, is like, is there a way to, um, you know, I know we don't know how many of our writers are federal worker or workers who have transit subsidies, but that's a talking point. I hear people raise all the time that we're, you know, giving up free money. Um, and that can't, couldn't we just means test it, plus students, plus elders. And as we're having um, survey data, I'm wondering if, you know, is there an opportunity to, to, pencil out what some of the administrative and operational costs of means testing um, or, you know, or partially implementing fares would be, but making a large percentage of the writers probably still eligible for fare fees to kind of figure out, I know I'm jumping to not technically mm -hmm. there, but I just, I kind of see the writing on the wall of where the conversation is going to keep going um, out among, you know, neighbors, um, you know, to to be able to get to the point where we have some talking points and some numbers, notional numbers of saying like, actually we, you know, we wouldn't even be looking at $4 million of fares or whatever we collected pre, pre fair free, because then if we did all of these other things based on what we know our ridership needs, it's going to be a much smaller percentage of that. These are the administrative costs that would go along with trying to manage that sort of process. Yeah, we can, um, that's, I think between all of us, we've got a lot of those things in our heads. I mean, one of the responses I gave is someone who asked me, you know, a good example of it is when we went fair free, there was a brief discussion about having a reduced fare program and certain types of people be able to ride free. It's, it's not the size of Dash and the reality of the cost of managing something like that is not only a problem for the staff, it's a problem for the rider because it's, it becomes a convoluted process. Oh, the rider barrier. has to yeah. qualify and it's it's yeah. awful. Yeah, there's all sorts so, of ways about people yeah, not, exactly not accessing yeah. means sets of benefits that yeah. they qualify for because of the barrier of it. But I think just even whether it's for now or in the coming year, preparing for the next perhaps budget talk yeah. or the next time fair free decisions come up is, is, is getting some notional figures of like, this is what it actually would cost us and how operationally unfeasible it would be, and and thus why it is actually a fiscally responsible decision to keep it universally fair for each. Yeah, it's like you mentioned. I mean, you drop a fourteen million dollar figure in front of someone to, to collect maybe three million dollars right. three yeah. years from now. Like, does I, I, I think that's absolutely <laughs> the leading talking point yeah, for this yeah. budget. I, I just think we have to. I, no, I think I think it's going to sure. come up again after yeah. this oh, budget assessment. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, this year the answer is we have to we took a grant that requires the, the free fares but i think getting the 104 is that you know then but keep the free fares but the bus doesn't go where you need it to it's uh, not right. useful to you and then it's just how much can you nip and tuck from service to try to deal with the increasing cost of fares you gotta kind of say we're gonna pay for the uh, new dash network uh you know ultimately and that's going to be the baseline for us i did have just one other sort of factual question on the 104 is is it current is it currently 30 minutes all day or 30 minutes during rush hour and 60 minutes it's a peak -peak? Only service it only operates during peak okay. and, it, right. and it does not operate all week yeah okay and it was before the new network it was 20 minute that was frequency yeah. so it went up to 30 minute yeah. frequency and this will move it to hourly frequency the atsp that martin has been presenting goal is to get it back to 20 minute frequency. So we're kind of going the opposite direction. And, and one other point that I would mention here, and this is mainly for you, Kirsten, because you weren't a part of the discussion back in November, is the reality is about 82% of DASH's budget is direct service costs. Only 18% is administrative. And if you look at the numbers here, more than half of this reduction is already made up 
by only 18% of our budget. So we're, we're, we've run out of space, right, to pull anything out of. And so that was why the board went forward with the blended proposal, because it just wasn't practical to even possibly get to the number that we needed to with those um, all with administration alone yeah. and that's partially for you but also partially for our audience because you've been asking that question yeah. right. i think that's a really salient point too is that just so people know like how how small of a person like how small of a percentage is, is everything about operations right um and and so what's cut has been and that's not a huge dash. I know that for right. most of the city, that's the case. So yeah. many people don't understand that just generally about government. I think right. government is like universally across the board like that, which is um, it's a challenge. So on the first page, we mentioned the line one, of course, we're supposed to be increased from every 30 minutes to every 20 minutes. Is that supposed to be 2030 ATP plan or because it says 2022? That's in the unconstrained version, right? Right. We originally adopted it in 2022 plan. It's in the Oh, the, that was part of the 2022? Oh, I thought that was the future. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So we kept it at 30 because we had to fund 102 and other. It was also pre, pre covid when it got to draft. But, but our, our plan in the, the new, the draft that gets to be able right now is that F126 would be the year of the drink. That's what okay. we're supposed to drink. Do you need a motion to authorize you to give this testimony? I, I do need a motion to authorize the testimony, and then I'm going to ask the staff. I've been taking some notes as well, but I just, I've just i written a lot of speeches about mm -hmm. Dash this week. Um, uh, and so I had indicated last night that I really wanted help in terms of getting testimony that was three minutes that I can largely just sort of pick off the shelf and use. Uh, is that something you feel like you have enough direction from us to, to be able to craft something along those lines before Friday? Three, three head nods over okay. there. The ones Great. Thank you. Uh, that'll, that'll help me a lot just in terms of, of making sure that we're we're ready to go. But, but yeah. it sounds like if 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 you're agreeable to it, we won't we won't mention specifically the supplemental. It sounds like that's really a staff related thing, maybe just to say that we're seeking to leverage grant funds wherever possible in any yeah. way possible. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And working with staff to yeah. appropriately okay. accommodate. So that's fine. I just feel like that would be stepping into a, a soup. They would need to know much more about that background. That's why because we were confused too about, you know, just how we ended up here with that. I think it does make sense. And you listening to some of the tax rate conversation last night, I think Councilman Gary specifically mentioned increasing dash service. So looking at the unfunded portions of the um, ATV as well, and those supplementals, because especially if they do a tax rate increase, that could allow them to, to cover a significant portion of that. So I want to make sure we get to that as well. And um, and because it hasn't come up yet, I just, I would very much like to second and strongly encourage that given that we are in an environment now where we're talking about what to do with uh, more resources, mm -hmm. I would encourage you to strongly advocate that they look at funding some of those dash um, supplementals. Yeah. And I think through the framework of like, it is an investment that leverages more economic activity and more, you know, especially as we talk about how do we generate more commercial revenue? Well, we help our employees get to the jobs that generate revenue. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to authorize you to deliver public testimony at the public, uh, the uh, budget public hearing uh, this Saturday. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Matt? Uh, any further discussion? So the testimony would cover the 104 reduction, would cover the um, that we are leveraging grant funding, and then would cover the supplementals in the 2022 ATV that remain unfunded. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any, opposed? any opposed? Any abstentions? Stay. Stay. All right. Thank you very much. I um, look forward to getting the testimony. All right, uh, the last little bit of my presentation, and then uh, Martin's going to run through these charts with you, is that financials are looking better and better by the month, and I want to thank the team at DASH for working so hard to, to make this happen. Um, we're now down to a projected end of year end deficit of about $4,000, a little over $4,000. Those of you who've been here know that was hundreds of thousands of dollars a number of months ago, so um, this has not been without sacrifice. It's not been without... Um, uh, a lot of uh, hard work by the team, and so I thank them for that. I do want to note that um, the effects of this have largely been driven by uh, our internal reorganization process, particularly in operations, which has been striving to make more efficient use of our resources and have the right resources in the right places. Our maintenance parts and supplies did de decrease. Um, some 
some in part due to changes in our purchasing processes, but also timing and suppliers. Is, so these things kind of come in waves. So we're being cautiously optimistic about that. But I think Edward is, has always heard me say, be very conservative in your forecasting. Um, so that could continue to improve. And we do still have a mandatory freeze. Um, and I'm not going to lift that freeze until we see this number go back to a surplus. So we would love to see this go to a, a, a pretty sizable surplus in the next couple of months. If so, then we can uh, release the um, moving forward on some of the things that have been held as a result of the of the of the budget. But it's a good news, so I won't belabor the the point. It's always nice to be able to say that, and I will hand it over to Martin to quickly run through the slide deck that he you have provided in front of you. Steve, are you okay to hear Martin from where he is? That's yeah, okay. okay. Great. So, um, so this is just the uh, the last item here. It's not it's just for informational purposes only. Uh, this is a onboard rider survey that we conducted back in the fall in October, November. Uh, this is a requirement of not only DRPT or their state uh, TSP, but also FTA. Uh, which is a business plan type of support to do a survey like this every five years or better. Um, so we did a survey where we had a survey crew at with vests on the on all of the buses, uh, had tablets, paper surveys, as well as a link to a, an online survey that people didn't have enough time to, to fill it out during their trip. Um, it was all across all routes. We had it in English, Spanish, and in part, um, trying to cover demographics, travel pattern, overall fast actually I think there were 37 total questions. So it was a little bit on the longer side, about 10 minutes. Looking for a long bus ride yeah. to fill out this question. <laughs> or just stand at 104 not, bus stops. We, we, we hire people to do that. They, yeah, they, yeah. 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 <laughs> so we had there, about 3,000 responses. Um, we did have a, a comprehensive data sampling plan that was written all based on current ridership trends. So we got a really good sample. So we could say, you know, line 33 on. You know, weekday evenings, so we've got a good sample for that. So I think for every route, all different time periods, we've got good things. Uh, next slide, please. So just starting out high level, uh, we, we got a good representation from all different zip codes across this, the city. This is their home zip code by for each of all the recipients. Uh, I did the math, basically about 37% west of Quaker, 37% east of 37% east of Quaker, and then 25% outside the city. So kind of a good good uh, separation. Uh, obviously, a lot of a lot of responses from that answers. Twenty two three eleven out of West End, <laughs> and then uh, along Two Street as well, and seventeen percent of the old thing. Um, race and ethnicity. So these graphs, uh, there's a series of them. The blue is shown to represent the city uh, data for all city residents from the most recent census. The yellow is Nash. You kind of compare how we're how our riders stack up against, or how 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 they differ from the city at large. Um, you can see that the the yellow bars show that the highest percentage of our riders. Identify as African American or Black, it's 40%, whereas the city is only 20%. Um, Hispanic, Latino, we have 24%, so about one out of every four Dash riders is Hispanic or Latino, compared to 70% for the city. Next slide, please. A gender, uh, we're pretty close to the city, uh, about 50 50, varying by 1% or so. Uh, by age, we have uh, the yellow bars, you can see 80% of Dash riders are under the age of 18. Uh, which is a little bit lower, but when you think about it, you know, uh, you know the city's 18%, but that includes obviously a lot of younger you know, kids who would be responding. Uh, the, the youngest uh, people that were allowed to respond to the survey, I think they said 14, 15, something like that. So we weren't surveying like seven year olds. So you didn't survey any toddlers? No, no toddlers. It's a very good question. Were we, so so no one younger than 14 could answer the survey. Yeah. And then were we even sampling during high school times? We were. Okay, so we did capture some students. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then also uh, about 65, you can see we have about 5% uh, of our ridership, which is a little, little bit lower than I was, what I was expecting to see, 13% for citywide. But um, yeah, just over there. Next slide, please. Martin, on the uh, over 65, uh, when we went from a more uh, ridership than coverage, mm -hmm. do you have data suggesting whether that extra walk to the nearest stop impacted those numbers at all? Don't have that specific data. And you recall that we had a lot of the graphs that showed like old network versus new network for access, like through that portal. Right, right. And that the was the concern we right. had with, with older folks. Right. So the number, the number, the percentage of residents, senior residents that were within walking a quarter mile. Right. Maybe not walking, but within a quarter mile. 
mile of a bus stop went up by a two and a half fold. Um, so a lot more people are aware of that square mile, but we don't know if there's if, if the reason we're seeing the lower percentage there. Is there a way to do a historical, um, you know, data on that? You know, um, and if not, no, I mean, I'm, I just think it may be significant. I, I, don't, I think one of my takeaways, uh, Hillary was mentioning from the other survey that they did ask a question about the barriers. And we unfortunately didn't ask that question, but I think the next iteration is something we're going to include and that, that might okay. speak to that. Next slide, please. All right, this is household income. Uh, you can see that uh, in the blue lines, the city has you know 20% above 200K. I think about, well, what is that? Is that about a third. A third is above 150k for the city. Another third are above 70. So, so two thirds of the city are above 75k, whereas two thirds of Dash are 50k or below. So you can see there's uh, three. There's an inverse relationship there between income and uh, between the city and Dash. You can see that 66% of our riders are making less than fifty thousand dollars a year. So, so a lot of our low income riders are producing Dash, or all of our residents are using Dash. Next slide. Primary language. Uh, one thing I was interesting: ninety-five percent of respondents said they could either speak English well or very well. Uh, so that's a, a good indication uh, that, that you know, uh, you know we, we do of course want to make sure that we advance our multilingual efforts. But you know, ninety-five percent is a good number that they're able to understand English. Uh, in terms of primary languages, um, Spanish was the second most common. Twenty percent, nineteen percent of our riders uh, have Spanish as their primary language. Um, so that you know, obviously a lot of our, our materials are translated Spanish, so that, that uh, bears that out. Amharic was the second, four uh, percent. Arabic was was third, three percent, and everything else was below one percent. Um, so I think you know we've done a lot of translation in Amharic. So, you know, Arabic might be another one that we look at. Do we have in the like within the survey results, not summary, but like in the other category, do we have the other languages identified? And so I assume like Dari Pashti is probably a big chunk of that other. And yeah. so that might inform future surveys about whether there's a need to add that language. Yeah, there were you know 10 other ones that were listed yeah. at you know one percent or less. Yeah. Um, and certainly when you dive down to the route level, like I think for Dari Pashti, if you were doing that about 35, you know, really doing Yeah. Next slide, please. So now we're getting down to the route level, which uh, gets, gets really interesting. Um, this is just dash riders, low, low income percentage and minority percentage by route. So you can see that, um, uh, so for, for low income, you can see that, uh, you know, the 35 and, and the 30 are kind of 42, 46%. Those are along the highest with 102 as well. Um, and then for minority, 35, 36 are, are the highest. Um, you know, 80, up in the 80% percentage, which is, you know, quite, quite high uh, when you consider that the, you know, the city as a whole is about 50% minority. So those are quite high. Uh, and again, you know, across the board, we have a lot of our frequent routes are, are very high in terms of minority percentage. But of course, the trolley is a little, a little bit lower on the percentage. Uh, ride frequency, we have, you know, 30, 31% are riding six plus days a week, but not just a weekdays, riding a weekend as well. But you know, at the only 20%, we've got about about 60% of our ownership is right pretty much every weekday we'll get. Yeah, a lot more frequent riders. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting some of the uh, more ridership behavior questions. Uh, we asked some questions about if you invited Dash before free fare, before the new network in September 2021. Um, the answers that we got were that no, a few different percent said no. So over half of our riders are, have started riding since we, we uh, went to free fares. Um, and so we asked them a follow-up question. So this was a conditional question. You know, if you were not riding before, did the instruction of free fares affect your decision to start to dash? 62% said yes, it was part of their decision. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, those that had been riding dash for longer than, than a couple of years, are you riding dash more or less since the instruction, instruction of free fares? We found over half of riding dash more. So clearly free fares have a big impact on increasing ridership and drawing in these riders. So why do people say they ride less? Did they That's go into the detail? <laughs> Um, six percent that, that may out. be just reaction to the, the changes in the new network to you know register are we still getting complaints that. about the youth riding to school and back yeah, from keep you know, residents they, they more crowded yeah. public health and less security or uh less concerns about safety security oh they don't feel safe okay this also may include capture some people who were daily commuters and now are once um, a week really commuters yeah. and also the introduction of our new network fairly closely maps onto the COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. It could be that there are some people that that's a slice that is just 
trying to be more cautious about being in public environments, period. I would say that what you said at day show, we haven't heard a lot, at least not rising to my level as we did when it first started, where we're talking about people being upset that they're students and they're noisy or they're crowded or there's someone who's unhoused or there's someone who's experienced mental health crisis or I'm sure those things are happening and I'm going to be interested over time and then we're working hard to kind of compile our customer service data and try to understand what are we hearing but it's not it's certainly not as vocal as it was when we first started mm -hmm. so to your point those people could be kind of the ones that sort of still feel that way but um, I consider it some good news that I, I tend to hear the things that are like the loudest. And so I don't, I'm not hearing that at all anymore, where I said it early on. Well, those folks to answer the survey had to be on a bus or waiting for a bus at the time they took it. So maybe there are some people who then stopped riding entirely because of those reactions who wouldn't be captured in the yeah. survey data, because these are people at least using it occasionally um, that they got. Yeah. And I would, and I just want to, I, this slide's incredible to me. Like, and I, I, like the data on the slide, I was using all of your communication about free fair network. I mean, this this is very cool to see. Yeah, yeah the next one too, free fairs. So, most important factors in Ryan Dash. That was kind of the other question that we asked them. You know, what what is really driving writing more? What is driving that decision? The way that we phrase it here was a little different than we phrased it in the past. We gave the top top three factors, uh, but as you can see, free fairs was. Uh, Almost 60% of respondents included, included free fares as one of their top three reasons. Uh, routes were where they need to go, and then reliability, the other top two. Frequency was was lower. Uh, it was uh, just under 30%, which was a lot lower than the first time the survey talked about. I think this is incredibly helpful, and I think this is where I also think about the Alex Move survey. And yes, it's like different, it's a different survey and different purposes, but I think I could see people being confused because that one says like cost is not a leading factor in decision-making um, in those survey results. So I think trying to kind of drill down and be able to sort of um, be able to tell a story uh, here is really important with those kind of two surveys out there, right? Yeah, more, more consistent in the line in terms of length and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Or just be able to distinguish like, um, you know, just like the population that the Alex Move survey is broader than Dash, things like that. Nice. You're going to show that stop amenities finding to your friends in Arlington before they build another million dollar bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of important things on here. Sorry, it's hard to choose top three. Um, and then the last one is just overall customer satisfaction. Uh, the are very satisfied. 95% um, satisfied. So really good numbers there. So really and yeah. Martin, does that 79% align with the monthly dashboard data that you show us? Because I know that also has satisfaction measures, which I seem to recall are a little higher. It does. Those right. are based more on the calls we get and the okay. complaints combination. Okay. We're kind of looking at some additional metrics that we can we can trace more or track more people to these, um, get a bigger sample size, and who our codes on board as it is the kind of thing. Uh, but, but yeah, they're, they're a little bigger. But, but, Still very high, but sprinkle. Cool. Martin, just back on uh, one slide ago. Sure. To, to me, that was good. I interpret this as like, what are the positive attributes of Dash that make you get on a bus? Right. But I guess another reason you get on a bus is that you don't have a choice. Like, it is your only means of mode. Is, is there a way that that is captured is it in this? Um, yeah. yeah, that is a good point. Um, I think the way that we worded it, most important factors in your decision should use dash. So you're for people that don't necessarily have as much of a decision. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that would be, yeah, we could probably maybe take it to worry that question. Yeah, I just, I, I, this is a really interesting to me, but my, my, Head goes to like, well, this is why they're choosing us with a whole model. Which, like, I know that's not how this works at all, but like, well, it feels right. like a, a competence. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. There's a lot of ways to tangentially get there with the data you have. Yeah. Just if that be interesting, if that's the past. It's like if you have a personal vehicle or not, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do you not? Do you have the carpool? Like that's yeah. those type of questions to get to. Do you buy, have the bike places? Yeah, right. that's only about like a third of the questions we ask. We have a lot of data. Oh, wow. like cool. zero, zero cars. Um, I'm really interested in zero car households. So certain routes, there's a lot of people who don't have cars. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't let that send you everything. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was a huge, huge amount of paper. Well, so, uh, <laughs> no, the, the, but we can get you. I think we included the, well, the report, but not the appendices. The appendices are separate. Yeah, you asked about the appendices. I said, that's like <laughs> a whole lot of raw data. Um, but to answer your question, there, there are a lot of cross tabs we can run to kind of think of that. And um, we did have a question about if you if dash was not a, an option for this trip, how would you have gotten it? You know? Yeah. And, and I think that one we can kind of yeah. get at. So we kind of do a cross tab on people that said, you know, I wouldn't have made this trip, or you know, I would have had to kind of walk or something like that. Thank you. Warren, I would just say I um, spoke with my colleagues on the Commission on Aging about the 104 reduction. I was very glad to be able to go into the transit strategic plan and actually, because we're not, you know, they always ask about what's the senior disabled smart trip card. Oh, right, we don't have, we don't capture that data anymore. But our survey broke down by route, pretty interesting demographic profile uh, of who the riders were. So I was able to share with them information about that. And I was really pleased with just how much information from this survey we had um, for every route. And each route really does tell an individual story too about, like, as you said, about who's, Who's writing, and that that information is out there for people who want to to see it and understand our, our profile, even in ways that we don't without smart trip cards anymore that are being tapped. So yeah, and maybe okay. just for others to be aware, uh, appendix A of the ATSP on dashbus.com slash strategic plan has route profile. So every single route you see, you know, what's the minority uh, percentages, where the language is spoken on that route. Uh, so that is available on that. And sorry, one other just sort of tangentially related. Um, is there any practice in transit agencies, um, us or elsewhere? I guess I'm doing like a potential customer survey. Like I understand what this is supposed to do and why you have to do it and the information is cool, but like you know, there was a slide about the six percent who don't ride it anymore. Have we ever is there any methodology out there for like you're within a quarter mile of transit, you know? Mm -hmm. What's your factors for using it or not using it? Yeah, so I believe it was back at the ATV. It was the last time we did something like that. There was a non-user study. And that, you know, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a great way to do it, but we had like a random phone with the mm -hmm. service that did random phone calls to try and get, get mm -hmm. information right. um, based on that we're not using Dash. Well, and, and the fact is when we did our reroute, there were people who probably were affected to an extent where they just weren't going to ride anymore. Yeah. You know, right on the cusp. Right. Yeah, I right. mean, we had much more increase, but mm -hmm. you're still going to have some loss. But there are ways to, like, the survey that the city does where mm -hmm. people will say, I have transit. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. And just before I announce the location, our next meeting is our budget hearing in May. The, the budget public hearing. The, um, let's see. Yeah, the budget hearing would be in May, and you would adopt the budget in June. The ATSP can happen either in April or May. The original thought was that it had to happen in April, but Martin has um, uh, convinced the people to be flexible with us. <laughs> but. I think ideally we would we would get the ATSP out of the way, um, and then the budget piece happens later because the city council has to finish their process too. Okay, I was asking more just for location. So April will go dash facility. May will be at city hall since we have a, a budget hearing um, since we have public hearing scheduled. Um, so next meeting April tenth, uh, five thirty p.m. will be at the, the dash facility. Um, just one more thing, very quickly. Um, uh, and when we were talking earlier about capturing feedback on the um, transit strategic plan and the um, specifically on the routes, um, the, we got a lot about the 104. We've gotten some about some of the other um, unfunded reduction, uh, unfunded supplementals. Um, since we're not doing a separate letter, can we forward? Can we prepare that feedback and make sure that's forwarded to the city so council has that prior to our work session on the the work session that we're part of on April 3rd, because otherwise those folks, it'll come to us, but they won't see it unless they're writing the council separately. So can we aggregate that and we send that formally to the city? Is that what we do? Maybe we do that already every year, but. Um... 
question is, is we could just email it to the, the compiler for the spreadsheet and email it through the normal outreach channels. Yeah, let's think about that. Okay. I think we be, those folks are probably expecting that their feedback will ultimately get to council who's appropriating. So I'd like to make sure we. Yeah, it, it is largely driven through the OMB process, which is pretty well organized and sort of, yeah. So. Okay. Or even if we can send it as, as public outreach, whatever, because public can certainly weigh in if we could maybe compile that and just send that. So that way yeah. it's, it's available. I just want to make sure those, those comments don't stop with, with us. Uh, sure. uh, okay. Um, any other business come before? Sorry, just, I just, there's also, uh, maybe this is an appropriate thing, but there is also a commenting form for them that they're getting, that council's getting every week. So that's another avenue. Do you think uh, the staff could use that to, to provide that? Uh, certainly that other way? boards and entities. I, I mean, if it's a formal letter from the board now, I think you there you send it. There's avenues for doing that. But just if there's comments to be received, I remind that there is a public comment form that council's getting every week and organizations have used it. So. Okay, so that we, we think we can use that. Avenue. I just wanted to make sure like we compile that and basically say, here's what we've heard about things that would concern council and their decision making on our, our budget. So, okay. Uh, is there anything else to come before the board tonight? If not, motion to adjourn. Sure. <laughs> City All guy there. always has to. Hi. 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 See you. Hope you're doing well. Watch. Thank you. 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 Thank you.